Hey, everybody, it's Debbie Potts, and I'm on a mission to help you endurance athletes navigate through all this information we hear about online, podcasts, blogs, social media, on how to fuel, train, and perform your best for life, for your future self, and for your races this year. So as I continue doing a 30-minute-ish podcast once a week, train low, race high is our focus today, talking about ways you can figure out how to best eat foods before, during, after your training, how to match your fueling with your training. So if you're doing an active recovery day, your fueling is going to be different than on a high intensity day versus a mapitone max aerobic function zone one, zone two workout. And then it's going to be different again, if you are a perimenopausal female versus a postmenopausal female and a male versus a female. So we want to really personalize your nutrition fueling plan and your exercise plan, as well as your lifestyle habits are a huge part of it. So let's go through some slides today and see what we can cover in 30 minutes. So here we go. How do we get to train low race high, be a fat adapted endurance athlete. So some notes here from Endure IQ and from S fuels, total training volume. We want to look at as an endurance athlete, we want to build that engine, that aerobic engine. So we're increasing the amount of mitochondria. We want to get that aerobic base first. And this is why I'm talking a lot about this right now, because as I record this, it's almost November. It's a great time of year off season for a lot of athletes to work on improving their base and really working on their fat adaptation process nutritionally and then put that all together. So we're going to work on what I call the holistic method, nutrition, exercise, sleep, stress, movement throughout the day, digestion, gut health is essential to have a healthy microbiome and avoid or repair your leaky gut. And then we've got hydration, and most importantly, I think is happiness, play, laughter, gratitude, because that is the oxytocin. <laughs> Getting love, gratitude, play, laughter, happiness is going to help mitigate that excess cortisol. So it's really important that we don't get so intense into this training and forget about the happiness and joy part. I was probably like that myself for years when I was training for Ironmans trying to win at my top of my age group every race, I was very disciplined, very dedicated, and probably uh, a little intense <laughs> before I got my adrenal exhaustion in 2013. So we really want to personalize your holistic coaching program to include some play laughter time so you're not so uptight, <laughs> type triple A as I was. So training volume to become highly functioning low carb athlete. We want to build that aerobic engine. As I said, low intensity endurance. We talk about that mapitone max aerobic function heart rate. And I did another video on is mapitone the same as zone one, zone two. So everyone's talking about zone two training now. And we've talked about that forever and talking about doing that 80% of the time. And then 20% of the time we want to add in once we create that base, a key high intensity workout sessions, so that 20%. So we want to train volume but we also want to train intensity. So Dr. Dan Plew's program and Endure IQ, we talk about this, increasing that mitochondrial protein function, tuning your engine with the intensity, and then training the aerobic engine. You're building your engine, and then we tune the engine with intensity is what they talk about there. So let me get the right button as I swear. So it's hard. Okay, so we've talked a lot on the dip different videos and been recording how to strategi strategically add in nature's carbohydrates. So if you are doing a higher intensity workout, some people may perform better and increase that speed, that power output with some strategic carbohydrates. Now that means like having some berries, having some broccoli, you know, asparagus, 
getting some good quality nature's carbs. If it's more starchy carbs as spaghetti squash at dinner with some good pesto or some grass fed butter, having some timing of your carbs where appropriate post higher intensity workout or saving those carbs in your meal in the evening time. So we want to make sure when we talk about carb timing, it's quality, it's processed food is what we want to avoid. So when we say adding in carbs, that doesn't mean the cookies and the crackers, and the pasta, the scones, bagels, stuff like that. We want to look at nature's food. So avoiding the typical athlete's fuel is what I try to clarify when I'm speaking carb timing in the low carb athlete that not all carbs are evil. It's looking at the quality of the food that you're eating is what I think everyone agrees on if you call it a keto diet or a carnivore, keto carnivore or paleo, the main thing we want to all focus on is avoiding those inflammatory oils, vegetable oils, omega-6 fatty acids outnumbered over omega-3s, the preservatives, the processed ingredients, the food allergens, refined sugars. So you have to make sure it's not avoiding all carbs, having nature's carbs in season as having some fresh berries in some heavy cream or having protein smoothie and you add in some frozen berries, something like that, or having your dinner meal with some vegetables on the side is great. So, but just timing those. So here's some more information, strategic carbs. Peter Defty talks a lot about this. Rob Wolf talks about this. It's having the carbs when needed when you're going into more of a speed workout anaerobic. So strategic carbs give your body the ability to push harder when the difficulty of the workload pushes against you. The hormetic response, hormesis, we talk a lot about is that acute stress. That's the stress that causes our cells to become more robust on a mitochondrial level. What we don't want to do is have chronic stress. So doing anything too much excessive is the adaptive process of a hormetic acute stress, a small dose, and be able to adapt, maintain, and increase strength from that. So we want to think of that also as our carbohydrates during the recovery phase where carbohydrates are low, nutritional delivery is high, your cells build more mitochondria via mitochondrial biogenesis. And this means that your cells have more mitochondria and each of your mitochondria become more robust. And it also says in this article that the way you can increase mitochondria in increase to increase the fat oxidation is two ways. The rate of the fat that you can burn, this is the ability to metabolize fat at higher intensity levels of exercise. Also note that insulin is an anabolic hormone. So when you sparingly in an insulin sensitive environment in an anabolic state, insulin helps build our muscles and cells. So a, an occasional hit of carbs can help drive the anabolic effects of insulin resulting in improved performance without affecting fat metabolism. So it's thinking that not all carbs are evil. It's what we have. And strategic carb timing is the backup rocket fuel for the metabolically flexible athlete. So the information we hear out there is not always designed for the endurance athlete that's healthy. So next we want to go into what we've talked a lot about is finding what carbs work best for you. So as I always say, test and not guess. So Rob Wolf in his book, Wired to Eat, you can look at a seven day carb test. I've said this before, but I'll repeat myself, finding 50 grams of carbs of one food, you take that food, you want to test, eat the 50 grams, there's a chart in his book, or look on his website and you test it. And you're going to take your glucose reading two hours after that. So you want to test and record your blood glucose reading. Now I just listened to a recent podcast on whoops, carb and your glucose. You don't want to have your glucose spike more than 30. So if you're using a NutriSense or levels or KetoMojo testing, pricking your finger, you're testing your blood that way, blood glucose, 
you want to avoid foods that are going to spike at more than 30. So your resting glucose should be around 70 to 90 at fasted. And remember in the morning, it might be a little higher because you have that cortisol higher in the morning that will raise the glucose. But post meals, you make sure that you don't have a, a big spike. So you don't want to go over a lot of functional medicine. People say 120. So Ben Greenfield had a podcast with the uh, chief medical officer of levels levels. Yeah. On his podcast. And they're talking about the average recommendations not to go over 120. So figure out what foods work best for you. So you can test. So what are safe starches? So some safe starches, you can look at testing on yourself. And like I have my biosense, you can measure with biosense too, and to see, okay, how are my ketone levels with my breath test is another way that's doesn't involve your pricking your finger, but I can do both keto mojo and biosense. So we got to look at which foods are good to eat. So you'll hear a lot, you know, the lectins, phytates, oxalates, anti-nutrients that plants have like poison. Think of it that way. And you safe starches are the vegetables that contain the most minimal amount of what's called anti-nutrients. So you'll listen to different people on more of the carnivore side that anti-nutrients you really want to avoid. So avoiding all plants, but there's some plants that are better than others. So all plants contain a protection mechanism known as anti-nutrients that discourage their consumption by mammals. So plants have seeds that are poisonous to your body. And so they are protecting themselves. So they have safe starches contain minimal to no anti-nutrients, especially compared to varieties of plants as grains, nuts, seeds, legumes, and nightshades. So safe starches in fact include white rice, and there's information white versus brown rice. Brown rice contains the bran, the hull, and husk, which are where the anti-nutrients are. So fact that white rice is actually a better choice than brown rice. I was always thought thinking that brown rice was healthier when I was growing up. So you think brown rice, brown, it's more natural, but actually that's where the anti-nutrients are. So white rice is better for you than the brown rice. Other safe starches include safe or safe sweet potatoes and yams, taro root, cassava, yuca, tapioca, plantains, and potatoes are questionable for some people. If you have a reaction to nightshades, nightshades, include potatoes, but they have that on the list. If you look at way back when the perfect health diet, Paul Jaminet has some articles on safe starches. So taro root, plantain, potato, rice. And you also le read about how to make these starches more digestible is cooking them and cooling them. So cooking your potatoes, but cooling them. Same with rice is better for digestion in your gut than having them hot. So what does 30 to 50 grams of carbs look like? So if we have a goal, typical keto is 20 to 50 grams total of carbs per day. Athletes, Dr. Dan Plews in the NGRIQ program suggest for male athlete, it could be 130 grams average per day of carbohydrates. But again, we want to match our fueling and training. So we can, you know, drop it back down, lower carb intake on days we're not exercising, higher 100, 200, some people, I've heard Ben Greenfield, some athletes, more professional, can go up to 300 and still be burning fat. So it depends on your workout, your intensity and duration, and males versus females. And then females want to look at their menstrual cycle. Luteal phase is different than follicular phase. So on the chart here, if you're watching the video, high one cup serving. So cassava versus acorn, squash, sweet potato, uh, potato, pumpkin, butternut squash, you can see kind of what it looks like for 30 to 50 grams of carbs. And I need glasses on to read this, but it's like, I think pumpkin says 20 grams, potato. So you can check that out. Rutabaga, leeks, green beans, again, cooked and then cooled spaghetti squash. So let me put on glasses. Wow, look, I can see. So butternut squash is 16.3 grams of carbs for one cup serving, a pumpkin is 20 grams of carbs, a potato, 26.2, um, corn, most people can't do corn, 
especially if you see it in your poop, you know, you can't digest it. <laughs> it's a good clue. Sweet potato is 41.6, 41.2 grams of carbs for one cup. So obviously sweet potato, acorn squash is 44.9. So 45 grams of carbs in one cup of serving. So you can tell which are higher carbs to lower carbs. Spaghetti squash is only seven grams of carbs. So if you want to test your glucose levels with these foods by itself, check it out an hour or two after you eat, but then, you know, matching your carbs with your fat and protein will help slow down that response. So uh, again, looking at nature's carbs, looking at when to time them. So again, I said some luteal phase women can add in more carbohydrates during that time, not be nutritional ketosis. And then follicular phase, you can go into more nutritional ketosis is good for some people who, depending on your training schedule, you can do go a little more keto and carnivore during different types of your cycle. And so another chart on vegetables, nature's carbs. Again, we want to look at, so for an athlete, how to fuel before your workout, I would go look at Vespa. We've done tons of podcasts with Peter Defty. You can find on debbiepots.net. And I've had um, two part series this year, 2022 on Vespa and carb timing. So it's that B propolis in it. So you can have a little bit before your workout, but Peter has lots of great blogs and vlogs, video blogs on his website. But so once you become fat adapted, and that's what we want to do this off season, get that fat adapted metabolic state, then you can keep fine tuning and building aerobic capacity to its potential. So then once we are fat adapted, and we went over that four phases that Endure IQ program, how to become fat adapted, you can find that in a previous video. But then once we go into that cold keto phase and then course correct in the final four phase that you keep just adjusting your macro ratio. And that's going to, again, vary on the time of the year. You, you can tolerate some concentrated carbs in both your diet and your fueling to get the performance punch, Peter says, to know without unintended consequences of a chronic high carb diet. So some people's performance may improve if you're doing a higher heart rate workout and then timing because you are burning some carbohydrates when you're you're not 100% fat you're always going to burn some carbs so strategically adding carbs in that evening meal and that will help kind of top off your muscle glycogen stores for the next morning and then post workout maybe you have a meal with some carbohydrates if you're doing a longer workout you know having a little bit of vespa beforehand or i've been doing the laird's creamer and bubs collagen and mct oil in my coffee to add some calories so athletes can tolerate a little bit if you want to improve your performance. You may experiment with this. Yes, I can do a fasted workout, but am I slow and sluggish and am I slow to recover? So you want to make sure you're looking at performance and that you want to balance your hormones that I'm not creating a stress as a female athlete going too low of carb and having that low energy availability and creating that energy flux in a negative way. So just to breeze through these slides, the fat adaptation and your IQ phases was on a previous podcast. So I'm not going to go into this, but just how typical keto person will be 60, 85% fat, 10 to 15% protein, five to 10 carbs or 20 to 50 grams, but a low carb athlete that's metabolically flexible, their carbs are going to be more around 20% and then fats could be 40, 50% and then protein 20, 25%. So I always start looking at people's macros, looking at their ideal body weight and figure out their protein from there and then adjust the fat. And then carbs are going to fluctuate depending on their workouts that day. And for females, break it up by the menstrual cycle. And then postmenopausal, they're more like a man because their hormones are more stable. So we can add more protein and fat. We're more insulin resistant when we are postmenopausal. So we want to go lower carb, especially then, I believe. So the phases, phase one, phase two, phase three is cold keto. And phase four is the finding your sweet spot. So that's where you continue once you find your fat adaptation process. And then we add in kind of course correct as we go. Okay, so that's what we went over previous slides, but phase three, what you go through 
kind of experimenting, but really testing, not guessing, you know, using this biosense is super affordable way to do your test is just the breath test that you use and you just blow into this and you can test easily a few times a day without spending a lot of money on finger pricking or the NutriSense is a great way too. Keto Mojo, you can test on nutritional ketosis for athletes. You know, I just look at, I mean, like 0 0.5, I don't need to be high, but moderate ketone level for some people that want to lose weight, recommended ketones to be 1.5 to 3. Post-exercise ketosis, they say you'll be a little bit higher. And then when people are fasting, you'll find it, you'll go a little deeper in ketosis if you're doing a, say, 48 to 72 hour fast. So for athletes, we just need that low level ketosis. The goal, I don't think, is really to be in deep nutritional ketosis as an athlete is to just make sure you're not burning fat. I mean, that you are burning fat and fat adapted. So you have less stress on your body being a high carb eater. So what you want to do is test your heart rate variability or HRV, test your glucose throughout the day track and measure your progression, and then adjust those carbs, matching your workouts to lower intensity and to higher intensity. So that was back a few videos ago, cold keto for women. They're going to do it a little differently and finding that sweet spot, you know, adjusting your carbs, eating. If you look at Dr. or Professor Noakes, the green foods list that they have for the Banting program, that's a great example of what foods to eat and, you know, continue to improve your fat oxidation with how you train, but also how you fuel. So we're just changing that standard American diet to the low carb, high fat athlete and changing the proteins and the fat and then adjusting the macros. Okay. So training low, racing high, I'm going to skip to really making sure you're testing heart rate variability, testing your glucose, your recovery, because we want to make sure if you're doing too low of carbohydrates, your heart rate variability will show that too. You'll probably see a decrease in HRV, but also for female athletes, if your luteal phase, my HRV is lower in luteal phase and it'll be higher in follicular phase. So it's harder to tell that way, but if your training is too high or carbs are too low, that can be a stress on your body, remember, and stress will show up in the heart rate variability. You're more sympathetic. Your HRV score will be lower. So adjusting the glucose carbs, if they're too high, that causes too much inflammation, higher intensity. If you're doing too much lack of recovery, your glucose on your Keto Mojo NutriSense will be higher. So that will be a good clue if you need to make adjustments. So that's why we always say test and not guess what your nutrition and recovery and exercise should be. If you're not wearing a heart rate monitor, if you're not doing, you know, whoop or aura ring, if you're not testing your glucose or your ketones, it's really hard to tell, am I doing the right amount for my unique body and my stress in my life? So high intensity performance is another thing. If you are decreasing, you're doing six weeks and you just are going slower and slower and your times are getting worse. Well, don't keep doing what you're doing, right? The rule of insanity, mix it up. So I would look at doing, you know, what I'm experimenting with. Okay. I'm, my speed work is not very good for me. So I need to add maybe a little bit of calories as in my Laird's coffee creamer, that's coconut sugar as a sweetener and mushroom adaptogens have that with some heavy cream and some collagen in my coffee. And that's just a little bit of calories might help me with performance or if it's having a Vespa or S fuels drink train beforehand, but adding in more, what's called the orange foods on the Banting diet might be something as the 20 grams of carbs that way for your evening meal can help fuel for the next day. Remember, so squash, beetroot, vegetables. We had some really good grilled zucchini and beets. My husband cooked the other night with steak and it was amazing. So mix it up. Okay, so touch the last bit here on the training. So training fits idea into your IQ, we want to look at what type of training and matching that up. So again, testing to figure out what training is best for you. And again, female athletes, we want to change our training throughout our menstrual cycle. And then postmenopausal women, you're going to look at more what your hormones are more stable. So we don't have to adjust as much. Postmenopausal, we talked about another show. You want to do 
pre and post menopause. So you want to add that 20, 30 second sprints and doing some heavy lifting more than excessive cardio. But if you love doing long distance events, let's keep our hurry down low and then finish with some sprints. So that's the 80% of our training to improve our fat oxidization. That's at level one, two, or MAF training, max aerobic function training that Phil Maffetone created 30 years ago and figuring that. And then we work the range of intensity, go polarized training. It's called that 80-20. And there's also pyramidal, pyramid type of training, that 60-40 split. So it depends on the training cycle you're in as early season might be more polarized and then you do more of a pyramidal training plan as you get closer to racing. So there's lots of good blog research links and all that on endureiq.com. So what does a 80, 20 training look like? Well, this is what I like to do for me. And in a lot of my clients, I coach, I do the holistic method coach. I do their nutrition, their training plan. There's monitor their sleep and their recovery scores. And we look at digestion and gut health with lab testing. So I can really personalize that information. And I look at genetics because this will change too. If you're more prone to, you know, your body's better to do more endurance or more power, we might adjust this a little bit, but basically zone one training is below lactate threshold. It's less stressful than training in two and three zone one. It requires less recovery time afterwards is to accumulate larger overall training volume as if you're training for Ironman or 50K run that you're focusing on that 75 to 85% of your time in zone one. So that's 80% of your workout zone one. And Dr. Stacy Sims talks about this as well. So zone one training is what I think of as more mapitone, that 180 minus your age, plus or minus five beats. That's your high number you're going to stay at or below. And then you want eventually, I think he's, a lot of times people need to stay at this base training for a few months and then you add in the speed work. So add in a small number of specific high intensity workouts in zone two or three. If you've been doing this, if people have been coming to me and they've been over training, I might keep them a little longer in that zone one training and then add in speed work. If you've been doing so much long, slow stuff, you might be like me that I need more speed work, especially as we age, that's what we lose. So you need a little more power pickups at the finish of your workout. So we want to add in specific high intensity workout zone two and three, simulate high intensity 20% of the time. So again, this is from Dr. Dan Plews and their research demonstrates that they have collected this research, the importance of overall training volume in the adaptation processes and specific adaptations to low intensity training seen in the type one muscle fibers. But as we age, you need to do more intervals. So especially females, I think we need more of that short intensity interval training. Dr. Stacey Sims talks about really key part for the optimal performance, but you can still stay in that zone two, zone one, training your body burn more fat for fuel and move that metabolic crossover point. If you did a test, see that, okay, I can burn fat at higher and higher heart rates. My fat oxidation level keeps improving and I don't go anaerobic till such and such heart rate. Then I can figure out where my 80% heart rate time should be spent at. And then the 20%, but DC Sims is suggesting 10 second sprints to 30 second sprints, especially for women called S short intensity training. So S I T. So get short stuff and you could do that at the end of your workout. Right. So I finished my low heart rate training. Maybe the last 10 minutes I do some 10, 20, 30 seconds. Sometimes I do a minute, but try to do 30 second intervals. And some days once a week, I try to do that on a hill. So I get some strength power. All right, so last little bit, carb cycling, a depletion in storage carbs, so training low and then cycling the carbs in. So Ben Greenfield had some information in the past on carb cycling and matching your fueling, a carb refeed day with your training. So Ben said a depletion in stored carb levels are accompanied by frequent bouts of training. The immune system can be depressed physical performance and mood can decline and risk of overtraining can increase. So storage carbohydrates should be so-called reloaded once per week. 
matching your carb refeed on a higher volume training day, typically like on a weekend, when you'll want to increase that intake, it'll be less damaging to the body. So suggested is staying low carb six days a week, and then one day going a little higher. You're not in keto, you're doing the 100 grams to 200 grams of carbohydrates coming from real food sources. And typically that's on a Saturday, Sunday for a lot of us training. So females, Dr. Stacy Sims will say a little different of your carbs. You want to eat some carbs for females because we burn more fat, but we start with burning carbs first before we get into fat burning. So what Stacy Sims talks about keeping your carbs light on active recovery day, when you're doing shorter intense workouts, like a CrossFit, you'll have say 2.5 to three grams of carbs per kilogram, moderate to high intensity training going, you know, an hour to two hours, it might be three to three and a half grams of carbs per kilogram. And then endurance training involving like your long distance stuff typically we do on the weekend, people at work, two to five hours of tense training. That's where we might go a little more. Now, I find this not personalized. I like to look at, hey, I'm efficient at burning fat. I'm more carbon tolerant. Maybe I don't need that much, but let's test it out. Do I perform better? Do I feel stronger? Adjusting my macros. Maybe instead of doing a long fasted workout, try adding in some calories, see if you feel better. So, you know, be open-minded about it. So females in the Dr. Dan Plews program have a better endurance the first half of their cycle. So follicular is day one to ovulation is around day 14. So female athletes, you might, you know, focus your training, your higher volume days, matching your cycle. Sprint performance may be best during late follicular ovulation. So like day 10 to day 16 and the early luteal, you know, going up day 20. So that's when you might want to add in more speed workouts. And that's actually where we want to add in more strength training is around ovulation where testosterone and estrogen is highest. So we kind of look at mapping out your cycle, figuring out the best times of the month when you're premenopausal to do your strength, hit those higher weights and then when to do more speed work when to do more longer distance like really if you're training for a marathon example maybe you're doing your longest run but match it in that first two weeks of your cycle and then the luteal phase is where our perceived exertions higher our heart rates higher for the same workload our cardiovascular intensity you know you just feel like you're going for a run and a week ago i can run this pace and it was felt easy this week it might feel super challenging so that's going to change and then you know, they found that the endurance will change, will be lower mid luteal phase. But interesting in their research, jump and sprint performance didn't change or high intensity. So that kind of can stay throughout your cycle to, if you want to look at that. But the endurance will change during your cycle for females. So let's move on, wrap this up. Female athletes, what changes? We'll talk about that high hormone phase versus low hormone phase. And then on my charts, I give my clients talking about mapping it out. Fat oxidization is higher. Ovulation lift heavier weights, luteal phase. We have increased stored and use of glycogen, more glycogen storing, sparing, increase in insulin resistance, decrease in glucose tolerance. So there's a lot that goes on in our luteal phase. That's just kind of where just got to take it easy. And then we might feel more hungry and have more cravings, but then we, I think this is just good to eat more meat during this time, <laughs> fill up on the progesterone building food includes the grass fed meat. So maybe that help you from overeating. So training low we've talked about. So let's dive into that next time. Really looking at fueling for training or racing S fuels has tons of great information low intensity training, how to time your meals, fasted versus fed, looking at Vespa studies. So really diving into my podcast, we'll tell you more. We've had a lot of good topics this year. So, you know, really looking at pre-training, how you want to train leading up to race, your taper schedule, you know, when to do fasted training, when to eat, you know, you have to look at what's your workout, what's your purpose. What do you want to get out of this session? What did I eat the day before? What did I do the day before for my workout? 
that's going to vary, right? So it's not one size fits all. We really want to individualize all this. So what you eat influences our rate of fat metabolism and how we adapt to that training as fuel is not available, but fasted exercise is eating no calories. So maybe some of us might do better just having black coffee or tea, but others might have a little calories. That's not truly fasted, but I'm still burning fat. So we want to preferred prefer fat for fuel. You might want to add a little calories in them that don't spike your glucose up. And that might be a better option for you than not eating at all. Thinking your body's stressed out. So check out S fuels. My podcast with Layton was really good going over training of fueling and looking at how to fuel for a race and how to taper for a race using their train, using the race plus and their gel. I've talked to you can in the past, but I'm finding S fuels is might be easier for some people to digest and having foods before race or training that don't trigger insulin is helpful. So getting the right foods before you work out, if you need to eat something for performance gains and then figure out, okay, I want to still be burning fat for fuel, but then maybe I need that rocket fuel carb partway through my race to pick it up and add a little speed and power. So really working with the coach to figure that out, I think is helpful when to add in something as us feels gel powder into a race day, but trying it out when to add in some caffeine before a workout is something to look at. And then race day, what are you going to do? So, you know, not having foods that are going to irritate your gut. You want that slow release carbs and having glutamine that helps reduce that GI stress and having, you know, post-workout shake that will help recover the damage you've done to your gut and your body and your muscles. So, you know, fueling before, during, and after is really important. So all this information is on my website in eBooks. So head to debbiepotts.net, look at my podcast. If you want to go back and dive into the ketone IQ or S fuels, you can use our code low carb athlete. Always ask me if there's a discount code, cause you shouldn't pay regular uh, price for anything. So <laughs> always ask for a discount code. Cause usually I can find one. Usually I use low carb athlete and that will help you out. So hopefully this helped you today, figure out a little bit more on the conversation I've been having this year on how to train, fuel, and perform as a low-carb athlete and how to time that fueling during the weekdays, weekends, and then when you're racing. So it depends. So let me know if you have questions.